This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Tuesday, January 16th, 2024 edition of Invest Talk, and we are now into the third trading week of the new year. And it is a market environment that is ever changing. 2021 was an interesting year. Then you had a tough year in 2022, a bounce back year this year. And then the big question is what will this year, what will this year have in store? Now I'm Justin Klein. I'm excited for this hour as usual to help guide you, give you some perspective and some data that can help you make better decisions with your money. Now we're going to run down the market performance for today. And there was certainly some news to be uh, be discussed. We're also going to touch on the show topics that we're going to try to hit on throughout this hour. But as usual, we're going to answer our first caller question now. Hi, Justin. Luke. This is Roger from Bay Area. I have a question regarding Pepsi, ticker symbol PEP. Due to all the GLP drugs news in the last quarter or so, the stock price has corrected uh, down to 165 bucks, which I feel is in a good buy zone. Do you agree with it? If at all, it's a buy. And what's your take on the GLP drugs, take on uh, the staple stocks like Coke and Pepsi? Thank you. Well, I don't think that the GLP-1 drugs will have a significant long-term impact on sales of junk food and fast food, et cetera. I think that's a lot of uh, the narrative right now. Um, and it's bringing down some names that I think are... Frankly, many of them deserved to uh, correct from a valuation standpoint. And Pepsi is one of them. You know, this hit a high of nearly two hundred dollars per share, about one ninety seven back in May, and now it's at one sixty six. Its fifty two week low is down around one fifty five, but it's still trading on forward looking earnings around twenty times. Which, you know, with the amount of debt that this company has. I don't know if I would pay 20 times. And that's my, my issue here. And, and the fact that it's a low growth name. Yes, their debt can certainly be, be carried. Their times interest earned is 13 times. So it's, they don't have any issues with defaulting on the debt. But I do think over time, that cost of debt is going to go up. So that's one issue there. Also, their growth. Longer term, their growth has been you know, better than the broader economy, but it's still not a, I wouldn't consider this a growth name. And so I don't love it quite yet. And the technicals are, are weak. And let me give you a, a, a support level on this. Yeah, so it bounced off support right around the 160 level. I said, like I said, 155 was the 52 week low. But I don't think the major, major support comes in until about 150. And the technicals, this bounce has been kind of meek. So from the technical perspective, I think this has another like lower down to the 150 level. And then at that point, when you start getting into the more like the market average, or slightly below average multiple, I think it's probably worthwhile there. So an interesting name certainly has good cash flow, good profitability long term. And I don't think the GLP ones will have a, a super long term impact on these names, because uh, frankly, th I've seen these gimmicks before. These diet fads and pills, they have side effects, they have problems. And ultimately, they are only good for a small slice of the population, not widespread. So I like it at 150, but not quite here. Now we have a lot of ground to cover in the next 40 minutes. And here's what I have planned. Our main focus point concerns this topic. 
Five ways investors can su- can succeed by knowing their limits. And it harkens back to one of my favorite quotes from my grandfather. And it was, you don't know what you don't know. And in life in general, you have to embrace that. Same with investing. You have to embrace that you don't know what's around the corner. But you know that if you take risks, you are compensated for that. But you have to do it within certain limits. It's not about taking risk at all. It's about taking smart risk. So we're going to talk about smart investment strategies, potentially a 60-40 investment portfolio and how that might fit into your overall strategy. So that's our main topic, but we have others as well. One is in regards to this year. What are the four main factors that investors, including myself, are watching to see how this year will go? What if it cuts one way, you have one market. If it cuts another way, you might have another market. So we're going to look at those topics. Also, how to avoid some common investment mistakes. And one is sometimes focusing less on what to buy and more about how much to buy. But we're going to dig into that a little further. And then lastly, the Fed launched BTFP and the banks are gaming it. So how are they doing that? Okay. Now we have some voice bank questions. One is in regards to value stocks and the other is PCG, PG&E Corporation. Now let's take a look at the market today. It was a decidedly negative day and it looks like the kickoff of Davos was a reason for the Fed or the Fed and Fed members to start to speak a little more hawkishly that, hey, the market has gotten ahead of itself. The pricing in five or six rate cuts by year end is too aggressive or shall I say too dovish. So their rhetoric so far is at least in Davos has been hawkish. And that really was a setback for the market today. Now, there wasn't really a whole lot of economic news. But tomorrow, we do have some big numbers, we have the Fed, New York Fed business leader survey on current business activity, we have retail sales, we have industrial production, We have the housing market index, we have inventories, we also have export and import prices as well. So that will be, uh, I think, the bigger market mover. Thursday, we have unemployment claims, we have housing starts and building permits. What else do we have? Friday, do we have any big news on Friday? Existing home sales, consumer sentiment. So there's a lot of economic news over the next few days that I think will be the driver of markets. Today, it was Davos, and you know, the market always tries to kind of latch on to things that they feel uh, can be impactful. And sometimes when there's no economic news, they ha- latch on to other things. I think the Fed is still in a pivot mode, um, but ultimately, it's going to depend on the economic data, and that will come in over the next few days as well. And then... We are coming up on the next Fed meeting, which is just two weeks from tomorrow is the next Fed announcement. Now, as we go to a break, let me remind you to check out our new Talk Classroom series. It is streaming now for free on our YouTube channel, and it's entitled How to Prioritize Your Savings. We talk about the 40, 30, 20, 10 rule, and Luke and I break this down over there. Now, the phone lines are open waiting for your questions at 888-99-CHART. Every investor is working to build a secure financial future. Would this be an opportune time to get into annuities? Everyone's situation is different. Get your thoughts on CRM, Salesforce. And so are their questions. And I was just calling for your assessment of Blackstone Incorporated. You get your take on QE. Ticker symbol L-E-C-O. Just wanted to get your opinion on JP Morgan. Invest Talk hosts Justin Klein. You know, I'm okay paying a 
fair price for a very good business. Steve Peasley. It's a very well-run company. And now Luke Guerrero. EBITDA growth is significantly higher than its competitors. Are ready to provide their unbiased answers. Each podcast is unique and you set the agenda. I will. Hey, hi, Steve. 24-7, rain or shine, Invest Talk is made better by the power of you. Call 888-99-CHART. Your objective is to work hard, plan well, and achieve financial freedom, right? You're in luck because Justin Klein is here now, ready to take your finance and investment questions. Call 888-99-CHART. Hi, this is Leo Blasquettes. California, PG&E, ticker PCG, just started giving a dividend again, and we're getting a penny a share. I think it's been like three years, no dividend at all with the problems they've been going through with lawsuits. So what does that tell you? One penny a share, it's almost nada, nothing. So what's your opinion on that? Will that eventually go up to 10 cents a share or who knows? I'll let you go. Thank you much. Take care. Thank you. This, looking at pg and &E, PCG is the symbol. This is a, an electric utility and natural gas utility in Northern and Central California. And this is one of the names that got caught up in the Northern California fires and they were held liable for parts of the damage due to down power lines, et cetera. And so it's just the business climate within California that uh, has put this company really in a dire situation. And now they are paying a dividend, but you know, does that really mean much? I don't know if it really does, to be honest with you. I think this is something that's just going to continue to struggle. Yes, it's rallied back some from a low of around eight bucks. Now we're at 17. But, you know, I zoom back out all the way to let me go to a weekly chart here. Yeah, it's high was in 2017 around $72 per share. Now, it's, now we're at $17 per share. And they have a ton of debt on their balance sheet. So, you know, a penny a share on a $17 stock, it's like kissing your sister, right? It's something, but it's basically nothing. And they have a ton of debt and they still are living or living. They are existing in the same regulatory environment. So I don't see any reason why you'd want to hold this. I think this is a clear sell and it's just starting to roll over. Um, so from a timing perspective, from a business climate perspective, all of it. Uh, it's nothing that I would want to own. Remember, you have to be very, very selective with your capital. You can go use it elsewhere and you can find much better opportunities in the market than this. Now, when people take the time to leave an Invest Talk podcast review on iTunes, we'd like to thank them for the courtesy by getting to their questions quickly. The Puma 51 says, love the show. How do you feel about this ETF? Ticker symbol PSCE. PSCE. This is the Invesco Small Cap Energy ETF. Interesting. So it's, it's an energy ETF focusing on smaller cap names. These are likely going to be your per, pure play EMP names because they're not large enough to have diversified businesses. And if I look, yeah, Helmer and Payne. Yeah, these are all pretty small. A lot of offshore oil names as well. So this would be a riskier version of like an XLE. It's going to have much more beta to the oil price. And if you're willing to take that risk and you want more diversity, this is a better name for you. My only issue, here's my only issue actually, is that there's only 28 names here. <laughs> you would think small cap, it would be very broad, a ton of different names, all relatively little. That's not the case here. So I don't actually love how little diversity there is. I like that you're looking at some of these smaller names, 
And if I go to like an XLE, you're going to be you're going to be highly subject or highly uh, exposed to exons and chevrons, which can be fine. But at least XLE XLE has 23 holdings. Jeez, these these ETFs are not very diversified. Um, but yeah, you're, it's just really going to be about whether or not you are willing to willing to take on the volatility. Is it going to perform longer term as good as Exxon and, or the XLE having such Exxon and Chevron? No, probably not. Because those aren't going to have the drawdowns that this will. So it's just about taking the risk and you have to be very, very comfortable with that risk. Because if oil prices do take off, this will be better than an XLE. Now we're heading into a break. I welcome your finance and investment questions now. You set the agenda. So give out Invest Talk a call at 888 chart The stock market is constantly changing, and serious investors know that they need to modify their portfolio assets to fit the times. And now, with more than 50 million downloads, Justin Klein and Steve Peasley reaffirm their commitment to providing unbiased finance and investment guidance here on Invest Talk. 888 99Chart. Now, as I said at the top of the show, one of the favorite quotes from my grandfather is, you don't know what you don't know. And that applies to broader life as well as investing. But that does not mean that you don't go on living life or you do not go on investing. In fact, the fact that you don't know is exactly why you get returns from investing. You get a return premium. The question is, how do you embrace that, take risks, but within the right framework? A framework that makes sure you are duly compensated for the risk that you are actually taking. Because there's smart risks and there's dumb risks. Right? Lending money to your deadbeat family member who, you know, is in and out of jobs and maybe has a substance abuse problem, that's a risk that you're going to get paid back. And it's probably not a smart risk. Versus lending money to a blue chip company, for example, probably use your money back and then some. So it's not just about taking risk. It's about taking risk in the right manner. Now, the first box you need to check is diversity of some kind. Now, there's certainly the there are a way to be over-diversified. So you don't necessarily need the most diverse portfolio. And that, and that's, that's the thing with investing. And really life, you know, we, we always get in these camps. It happens in politics as well, where we get very polarized. And that's just the uh, human nature. We're tribalistic beings. We're all in or we're all out. But reality is life is generally in some gray area. And usually the extremes is, are, are not good places to be. And having a middle ground and a compromise usually tends to be, right? You don't want to be completely undiversified and focused on one asset class or one particular investment. And you don't want to be, have a little bit of everything either. So getting diversified is, will cushion the blow and keeps us from being left out in the cold. So you want exposure to most sectors, asset classes, etc. But having too much of one thing obviously is not smart. The next is holding some cash. We know there's going to be 
events that come out of left field, whether that's a pandemic, whether that's a long-term capital management blow up in 98, whether that is the financial crisis in 2008, whatever that is, there will always be these episodes. Because I talked about, I believe, uh, 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 last week, I was talking about over the last 100 years, you've had all these world wars, all these problems, but equities still return 10% nominally. So you know there are going to be these events, but having a little bit of cash on the sidelines can do two things. It can have a psychological impact, saying, okay, I'm fine, right? Market goes down, there's some sort of event. I have some cash here where I don't need to go and make a rash decision with my longer term money. Whereas if all your money's in the market at all times, that not necessarily a comfortable place to be when the you know what hits the fan. Now cash will have a drag on returns generally, but that's all else being equal. A lot of people will be less prone to impulsive actions, right? Investing with emotions, making decisions with emotions uh, if they have a little cash on the sidelines. Number three is avoid leverage. Now, if you took leverage and you were able to keep leverage over the long term, your actually returns are going to be higher. The problem is, is that Those panic moments, leverage can be, can ruin you. And you can't allow those returns to compound when you lock in losses during rough times because you were over levered. So this was what happens if you buy levered ETFs often, or you buy, you know, uh, you just put your count on margin, or you buy options, things like that. Warren Buffett even said, if you don't put on leverage, you don't get in trouble. That's the only way a smart person can go broke, basically. And I've always said, if you're smart, you don't need it. And if you're dumb, you shouldn't be using it. And I completely agree with him. And the last one is sit on it. Right? Don't panic. Have a longer term view. In any 20 year period, equities have made money, whether you're in large cap or small cap. And like I said, over the long period, you, you want to be in for those big years. If you miss out on one of those big years, that can have dire consequences over the long run. Now, on the next Invest Talk, we'll look into the story behind this headline. Why have bonds been so volatile? That story tomorrow. But for now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm ready to take your calls at 888 chart Have you been using the Mint app to manage your finances? If so, you are going to be making a change because Mint is shutting down. And the Mint people want you to transfer to their Credit Karma product. But hold on, there is a better alternative, Monarch. That's right, Monarch is the modern way to manage your money. With Monarch, you get clarity, confidence, and peace of mind for your finances. You can track all your account balances, transactions, and investments in one place. And Monarch even has a tool that allows you to easily import your data from Mint. Speaking from personal experience, Monarch's intuitive design, features, collaboration tools, customization, and constant product improvements are far above any other financial budgeting app. And it's ad-free. Monarch eliminates what was previously stressful, confusing, or overly time-consuming. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, cash flow, net worth, and more. Plus, create custom budgets, track progress towards your financial goals, and collaborate with your partner. After trying out Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, listeners of this show will get an extended 30-day free trial when they go to monarchmoney.com slash investtalk. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash invest talk for your extended 30-day free trial. Go to monarchmoney.com slash invest talk. Every investor is working to build a secure financial future. How they get there and when they get there 
That depends on many variables. The more you learn about how the market works, the better your chances. So don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. Hi, Justin and Steve. Both of you continue to reiterate the importance of value stocks in our current and future environment. And rather than asking a particular stock question, I was wondering for someone who's researching, evaluating, and then ultimately purchasing some value-oriented stocks would be the the major criteria to look for. Uh, For example, whether they'd be mostly large cap companies, dividend pairs, you know, maybe dividend growth, and also some uh, key metrics regarding earnings and numbers to look at. Thanks again and look forward to your intelligent answer. Bye. Well, there's no there's no one right answer, but there are a collection of features that classify a value stock. Now, dividend investing is kind of your classic value investing style. That's what really v- dividend investing is masqueraded as. Because most dividend payers, they have profitability, they have positive cash flow, they trade at somewhat reasonable multiples, especially if they're yielding you know, 2 3% or more and can pay that consistently. So the first thing, yeah, is typically a dividend, but it doesn't have to have a dividend. Okay, does not have to have a dividend. But it's usually trading at reasonable multiples to sales and cash flow and book value. So typically price of sales, three and under, four and under, at least four and under. Ideally, you want to see that low, but a lot depends on the margins a company has. So price sales is not a great tool because higher margin businesses are going to trade for higher price sales because they turn a lot more of those sales into profits. And obviously, you're looking at profits, lower PE ratios, but things like we like to look at enterprise value to EBITDA. So EBITDA is more of a cash flow measure. You can even look at enterprise value to free cash flow. That's another one. Enterprise value is going to include the debt into the balance sheet. So you want that enterprise value to be not much more in percentage terms than the market cap. That's how you know that the balance sheet is relatively stable. So you want to look for that. And then profitability. You want not just high profitability, but consistent profitability. We look for return equity mid-teens or higher. Return assets, hopefully high single digits or higher. So these are just a few of the things you look at. And these are all quantitative. And that's what I think most people miss about the analysis of individual stocks is the, the numbers, the quantitative analysis is somewhat less important than the qualitative analysis because the quantitative analysis is giving you a snapshot of today. The qualitative analysis is going to give you a much better understanding of the future. What is the strength of their, their business? What keeps them having a competitive advantage? the quality of the products they're producing or the quality of the service that they're providing? Is it scale? Like think of Walmart, right? Walmart has cheap prices because of scale. They're not the nicest stores with, with the best service that you walk into, but they have low prices because of scale. And then leadership. What's the leadership team look like? What type of track record do they have? Are they like to stay in place for a while? These are all qualitative ways to look at companies. So that's where, in many ways, the secret sauce comes in. Because anybody out there can go look up numbers. It's readily available. You can go download the latest earnings report. 
read the latest earnings transcript. It's not se secret, right? But it's the qualitative aspect as well. So while you're looking for value stocks, I gave you some metrics to look at. Make sure that's the beginning of your search, not the end. Okay. Now let's touch a bit on this year, 2024. And what questions are top of mind for investors? Now, the first is going to be, can the market broaden out beyond just the MAG7? Because that MAG7 was responsible for the most of the S&P 500 gains last year. Which means that's a narrow rally. And that means you're more vulnerable to a downturn. Now, the positive is, since the October 7th, 27th lows, small caps have outperformed. The Russell 2000 up 19%. The equal weighted S&P 500 is up 17%. Whereas the S&P is up 16%. So not a big outperformance, but certainly outperforming. So that's helping give some technical strength and diversity of price movement. And the question is, will that continue? Now, as of late, the last week or so, that has it. Let's pull back a little bit. So that's one question I will continue to be watching. And if you watch my uh, videos that I do on our YouTube channel every weekend, I go over this, those ratios and kind of what the trends are happening in the market and they're, how they're emerging. So that's what I'll be watching. Number two is will Fed cuts spark a better market rally or a continued market rally? And will there be a pullback going into those rate cuts? And the answer is probably yeah. Since the 1970s, the S&P 500 has noted a median decline of 1.8% in the three months leading up to the first rate cut. Basically saying, hey, there needs to be something semi-breaking. Think of the banking crisis last year. Right, where there was a mini crisis, certainly wasn't widespread, certainly was very siloed into one part of the economy or one part of the market, but it provoked the Fed to expand its balance sheet. That's what BTFP was. Or at least that's what BTFP did. Right? It allowed banks to get more capital, sure up their balance sheets. And that expanded the Fed balance sheets, expanded liquidity. So there likely needs to be some sort of event like that. But that's an event to buy. Why? Because stocks gain on average of 20% over the course of an easing cycle over the same period. 20%. So that basically says between now and the first rate cut, Market's are probably going to be choppy. It might be down a little bit. But that's not, just like I was saying all last summer, there was nothing about that pullback that made you, should make you worry. It was very controlled. There wasn't a credit crisis or anything like that. And frankly, first quarter, I've said this. <clears throat> I think late first quarter, early second quarter could be a time period where you get a little bit of that volatility. Five, 10% pullback in markets, a refresh, get people a little more bearish again, thinking about 08 and the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket, Fed pivots, markets rallies to new highs. That's probably, that's my playbook for the year. And then the next question is what about a recession? Everyone's expecting a recession last year. We didn't get a recession last year. Why? Because inflation continued to ebb. The labor market, while weakening, still was okay. And consumers, a lot of money in their pocket still from the pandemic, and they spent. So will that be the same? Well, the odds are actually no that it won't be the same as last year. Why? Because since the late 1950s, the average, on average, 23 months past the initial rate increase 
in a hiking cycle, that's when the economic downturn started. Right now, we're 20 months, 21 months past. So on average, it should start in the March timeframe. And then lastly, it's kind of separate, but is related to the economy. Mortgage rates pulling back from eight to around six and a half now. What does that mean for the housing market and thus overall economic activity? I think it's going to be positive. The, the way to solve the housing price, housing crisis is to bring more supply on. And home builders are building, multifamily builders are building. And I think that adjustment period will take place, but I still think it's going to take a number of probably months and probably years <laughs> before you get a true correction in housing prices. So those are the questions that we're asking as investors, professional investors. And those are my thoughts, but as usual, you have to be flexible, not tied to any one narrative or, or a thought process and, and uh, kind of adjust as the data comes in. Now, we started a new year and a fresh first quarter. And the big question for you is, do you know how to handle those situations? Do you have that perspective so that you can not get shaken during a 10% market pullback. Do you have a portfolio that is aligned with the current trends in the market? Well, if you need help understanding that, whether you're prepared for your goals and your ultimate financial freedom, and if your portfolio is set up for that, well, I encourage you to reach out and schedule a free portfolio review assessment via telephone or go to meeting. Just send us a message through investtalk.com. Let's keep things moving and play another caller question from the Invest Talk Voice Bank at 888 chart Hi, my name is Ali. I'm calling you from the UAE. I'm looking at BYND, Beyond Meat. I've owned it before, and I did really well with it, but I sold it on a, on a, at a good time. I think that it really, has really come down significantly, and I think that's probably because of falling sales. But I just want to get your idea as to a good entry point. It has shown a bit of strength recently. And I was wondering what a good entry point would be. If you could let me know, uh, that'd be very useful. Thank you. Bye. The entry port is, point is to short this at any given chance. This is the antithesis of the type of business, business that you want to own. This is not a business. This is a stock issuing scheme that is hyping these alternative meats. This company has never, excuse me, sorry, 2019, they did made four cents a share. But they absolutely, since then, have been hemorrhaging capital. I'm not, first off, caller, I, I don't know your background, but please, you need to back up and reassess how you view goodbyes. Because there's nothing about this company that is attractive. Absolutely zero. This is one of the worst companies that you can invest in, hands down. Hands down. This is company will go bankrupt and the equity will be worth zero outside of some miracle that another company wants to come in and buy them, but they'd have to be suicidal to do that because they probably want to lose their job. <laughs> you need to be looking at companies that make money. This is pretty much never made money. And it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. You want companies that have positive cash flow, that are buying back shares, that are paying a dividend, that have good businesses. And this is one of the worst businesses I've ever seen in my entire career. So run far away. You want to buy the exact opposite of what this is. Let's play two in a row from 8 at 8, 99 chart. Hello, this is John from Oregon. I'm wondering your thoughts on bank stocks and Citibank in particular. Thank you. Oh, Citibank. Well, bank stocks are improving mainly because the Fed's pivoted. And they provided the BTFP program that's allowed them to muddle through this scenario. Historically, Citi has been one of 
the poorest large banks from a return perspective, from a performance perspective, et cetera. It's just simply in a long-term downtrend. And I've said this for a while. If you're going to buy the large banks, just buy the best JP Morgan. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. It's been the best performer. Now, the others that are pretty good. But City isn't one of them. If you pull up their profitability, let me do that right now. Currently, return equity is 5%. It's been sub 10 really since, since the financial crisis. It's never really recovered. For being honest. Right? It fell from split adjusted because it did do a 10 for one reverse split. Uh, it was at $562 per share uh, late 2007, 2006, excuse me. And then it fell to a low of $14 and now it's at 51. So it's been kind of just chopping sideways since then. And its profitability has been subpar. So if you're gonna buy a large bank, look elsewhere. All right, now we're heading to our final breaks. Get your questions in now at 888 chart You've got a portfolio to grow and protect, and this is no time to lose focus. So get your finance and investment questions together and call Steve Peasley and Justin Klein. They're ready with their unbiased answers. Invest Talk, 888-99-CHART. Hey, this is uh, Andrew from Atlanta. I was trying to reach Justin or Luke. I wanted to ask you guys about ticker symbol GGG. That's Graco Incorporated. I've held the stock for a while. I'm up about 25, almost 26%. Would it be ideal to maybe trim this right now or no? Maybe I should just keep hanging on to it. If I wanted to add to this, what would be a good price to add to it at? And just a curious your analysis on how this stock's going to look going forward. I listen to your answer on the show, and we are all praying for Steve to get well and come back to us. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for the thoughts on Steve. Actually, I'm headed over to his house after the show. Uh, but you're looking at Graco. And this is one of those names that used to be a small cap name, and it's grown throughout the years. And now it's firmly a mid cap. $14 billion market cap. Earnings in 2016, $1.18. Last year, once they announced earnings, it's supposed to be $3.05. Another $3.17 expected earnings this year, and analysts are upgrading those earnings expectations, both of them. So that's positive. They have pretty much no debt on their balance sheet. In fact, they have net cash on their balance sheet. So I love that. It's enterprise value, valued EBITDA is about 19 times, and this is where I have a bit of an issue, okay, is it's still a bit higher than its longer term average. You know, typically trades around price to free cash flow in the mid 20s. And right now it's in the mid 30s. So I do think that it is a bit rich currently. Now that could be because the market's pricing in a, a better 2024 uh, and that growth there and the analysts are upgrading those estimates, etc. But, you know, my main thing is I probably wouldn't get too cute. You know, if you want to rebalance it here, because it's a little bit overvalued compared to its history. Sure. I see no problem with that. But you don't want to trim it too soon. You don't want to trim a good company with return equity of 26%, no debt, 20% return on assets. I just don't see a reason to get too aggressive in cutting this. Now, from a risk perspective, if it's ballooning to too much of your overall portfolio, sure. But I wouldn't get too cute. I would just hold it. 
Thanks for the call. Now, lastly, I want to touch on an interesting study that they did with a bunch of young people. It's a college uh, study. They were college students in finance and economics. And they were given $25. And they were asked to bet on a coin flip. But they told that they were told that the coin flip had a 60% chance of coming up heads. And they had 300 tosses. And they could choose each bet size. And their winnings capped would be capped at $250. That's an easy deal. Simply betting 10% of your cash at any given time would give you a 94% chance of getting to that cap of $250. But players, on average, their pay was only $91, a fifth of that cap. And 28% of them managed to lose it all. And what this tells you is that despite what's pretty obvious, that just having a smart, steady investment philosophy and strategy over the long term will beat out taking huge risks. But you have to stick to it, right? You can't get distracted by the shiny objects as well. Independent thinking showed success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461.